So uh, today the topic of discussion is a skin rash in a children from a rheumatologist perspective. So, so today what I have decided, I have got only uh, 10, 12 minutes in my hand. So what I have decided, so not to show you the classical things which you must have seen at least 100 times in uh, different clinical presentations and meeting and in order to do clinical practice, all these clinical, uh, classical clinical thing where rheumatology and dermatology uh, collaborate for a diagnosis and management of these patients like neonatal lupus, Kawasaki, or this classical dermatomyositis. So today my uh, talk outline has been planned to, to show you four practice-changing cutaneous clues. So one uh, cutaneous nodule, one recurrent oral ulcer, one shortness of breath with like very vasculitic skin rash, and one visigiosis. So let's move uh, to the case and discussion. So this is a case of 11 year old boy had a history of recurrent streptococcal throat infection since the age of five years. And at the age of 10 years, he developed subcutaneous nodule with overlying erythema on the lower extremity and feet. So initially it was thought to be uh, erythema nodosum due to the post streptococcal infection. Uh, and, and, but to the utter surprise on a biopsy of the, uh, from the nodule, it turned, to be a, uh, turned out to be a non-granulometrous necrotizing arthritis of medium vessel. On further inquiry, uh, his elder brother also had this kind of skin rash, which is very classical for levator racemosa. And he uh, has also history of recurrent uh, stroke at very early age of 11 years. The biopsy from the levator racemosa also showed the very similar thing, that non-granulometrous necrotizing arthritis of the medium vessel, and finally, a diagnosis of medium vessel vasculitis was made. But problem was in this patient, there is something, uh, there are some odds like uh, the, two, it's, the age is too early for a uh, severe stroke. So, and that is a very strong family history. So uh, the clinician decided to go for an whole exam sequencing and then sequencing turned out to be uh, the recessive mutation in CEC region, the gene that encodes adenosine DMNS2. And the final diagnosis is a data to PAN. It's a monogenic variant of PAN, which, uh, which was first uh, described in the year of the 2014, published in New England Journal of Medicine. The initial case reports were from a family of uh, from uh, Israel Jews. So th there is a family history of very early age of onset recurrent stroke with vasculopathy. You can appreciate this uh, digital gangrene, libidor kind of rash, this aneurysm and this vasculitic vasculitis and biopsy. So what could be the clinical spectrum of this uh, data to pan and which is different from the usual pan? So from the cute, uh, dermatological perspective, so if there is levido reticulitis, levido racemosa, ulcer, subcutaneous nodules, the north and digital necrosis has been reported in association with data to pan. Important thing is this, this is the very usual things which oh, you often un, 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 encounter in your day to day practice. But if you got a referral from an ICU setting, like a child having a stroke and child also having a, this kind of uh, different cutaneous ulcers, just think of data too, because uh, the treatment part is entirely different from the usual uh, uh, management of PAN. These patients require very high dosage of immunosuppressive therapy and even biologics in, to start with, uh, because they are usually refractory to steroids and all other usual managements. So is there any Indian data? Yes, uh, uh, this, uh, in this paper, uh, the six pediatric patients reported from uh, multicentric uh, study, but unfortunately there is no contribution from the Eastern part of India. And there is a, all the six patients uh, mostly reported from the PGA Chandigarh and SDPGI. All the patients had uh, uh, that very classical history of uh, stroke and the cutaneous, different cutaneous manifestation that I have already shown. And there is a separate paper uh, describing 33 adult patients, but again, there is no contribution from this eastern part of the India. So currently, I have a collaboration with this two guy, uh, one from uh, Boston. Uh, the, this, he's an assistant professor uh, in pediatric rheumatology. He looks for the ADA enzyme level because uh, it, it is not done anywhere else in the world. And she looked after the, for the genetic sequencing. They are the people who originally described the disease. So the second uh, cutaneous uh, current, uh, clue is recurrent oral ulcer. So this is a very, uh, I think this is a very common clinical problem which we all encounter, especially maybe in dermatological clinic. 
the history of this patient is a two year old female child with a recurrent oral ulcer and genital ulcer and she also had a colitis and refractory ulcer requiring repeated hospitalization the markers of the inflammations were elevated and hlb51 was uh, positive for that patient so uh, otherwise this is very classical for bashes syndrome and uh, um, uh, because we know hlb51 is a very strong association with bashes and recurrent oral genital ulcer this this makes a uh, diagnosis of bashes uh, there is no doubt but uh, problem with this patient uh, again the if you, when we encounter uh, ask for the brother who also had a recurrent history of oral ulcer and at the age of 5 years the she develop, uh, presented again admitted with headache and blurring of vision relapsed with the oral genital ulcer and also uh, papilledema and uh, mri showed a type 2 anal cherry malformation so important point to remember here if if you are having any patients with a very severe disease which is refractory treatment and uh, in uh, basic at this age at least Uh, we don't usually expect to have a colitis and a very severe colitis or uh, re uh, refractory ulcers this and and the family history these points towards something else something more we are dealing than a, than a usual basis the final diagnosis for this patient was an heterozygous loss of function mutation in TNFAIP3 leading to haploinsufficiency A2 this is a, another relatively new clinical entity described in the year of 2018 again by uh, that lady queen so and this patient was admitted with us in pgh and here uh, so uh, what could be the, uh, the the clinical cutaneous manifestations are like the bashes but some of the patients often diagnosed as uh, uh, partial psoriasis so histopathological clue for uh, the dermatologist when one should suspect of ha20 is uh, mucin accumulation is a feature is uh, of connective tissue disease which is like classical for um, lupus but not characteristically seen for palmar plantar fasciculosis or fasciculus psoriasis so this unusual finding uh, which rather fits with an ha20 like a patients with basis like presentation or palmar plantar fasciculosis or psoriasis palmar plantar psoriasis having this kind of uh, histopathological features uh, we should start thinking of ha20 because uh, because they they are a bit different from the usual basis mostly they have got a very they can have an uh, high grade recurrent fever but two important points like uh, they, they usually have very severe eye problem and if you don't treat it aggressively and appropriately they they, they can be blind and another uh, gi uh, involvement is a very significant prominent features of ha20 uh, which can even uh, lead to death of the patient due to gi perforation the third cutaneous clue is a shortness of breath with pain also this patient was admitted with uh, in, in sskm in medicine ward Uh, the, this 13 year girl has a, a presented with a fever and shortness of breath with this various uh, skin ulcers the, you can appreciate over the elbow and the hand there is a one large ulcer on the back and this uh, there is a contracture in this knee she cannot extend that time there is a fever the shortness of breath she was requiring uh, oxygen all the time so uh, initially the treating physician thought it could be some some of the connective tissue disease based on this uh, this fever and this skin rash whether we are dealing some kind of vasculitis or not the uh, they have sent for all the work up the her ena turned out to be positive in a low titer uh, but rest all the investigations were negative so that that that, that point of time the dilemma start what actually we are dealing because in a lupus with this kind of florid presentation we don't expect that is a low titer ena positive and negative for all rest of the markers like complements and other ena specific markers we don't expect to be negative in a florid cases so uh, when you got the referral uh, this is a very classical constellation of there is a cutaneous ulcer there is a lung involvement which was initially treated as an um, infection in view of fever and all those things but it was a rapidly progressing interstitial lung disease so as in a uh, child with a rapidly progressing interstitial lung disease and this kind of cutaneous ulcer the patient also had a myositis Uh, which often got overlooked because some of the patients can have an amyopathic myositis but this patient also clinical myositis but she was too sick she was bed bound so no one uh, actually checked for the myositis uh, specifically so this this entity uh, turned out to be mda5 associated uh, dermatomyositis which is variant of dermatomyositis 
but it is important to know this variant because because of its prognosis and uh, its, its management part. Another uh, classical cutaneous clue for the MDF5 associated myositis is the inverse bottom. There's a papular lesion over the pump is a very classical association with MDF5 associated myositis. So we, we need to treat these patients very aggressively. Otherwise, uh, the, the most of the series has shown a very high mortality rate. Up to 50% patients die due to mostly due to the rapidly progressing lung disease. But most of the patients uh, don't get diagnosed because they got treated as an infection, lung infections and all these things because of lack of the usual marker. Because unless you ask for specifically for MDA or anti-MDA, 5 antibody, uh, uh, you, you can't diagnose this, this entity. So this is the follow-up of that patient. So you can appreciate this is uh, last week she came for the follow-up and you can appreciate the skin ulcer. This is a very difficult skin ulcer to uh, uh, manage. She, she, she required cyclophosphamide in a mesotrexate in a different varying combination, different time. So, uh, some of, uh, currently, she is doing well. Uh, so, it, so, this is very important to uh, know the entity and treat the entity very aggressively. The fourth clinical entity, which I, I, I would like to mention, is the deciduosis. You often uh, you can get a referral or uh, patient may visit to OPD. With this kind of BCG itis or BCG osis, so this kind of post BCG, this axillary uh, abscess or uh, ulcer, or there might be a disseminated tuberculosis even. But these things are not very usual to have. Like uh, uh, unless there is some kind of immunocompromised gene, one should not have BCG related infection. So this should be the point of time one should suspect uh, any underlying primary immune deficiency disorders. This is uh, another clinical uh, experience from um, multicentric uh, um, study from India. Again, no contribution from the eastern part of the India. 55 patients were reported of having Mendelian susceptibility to the mycobacterial disease, and 82% uh, patients have uh, BCG-related problem uh, in, in, the, in that cohort. So uh, though it's not, these are the genes which are, uh, uh, yeah, responsible for, there are nine genes which are responsible for this uh, MSMD disease, mendelian and susceptibility to the microbacterial disease. So, and this is a distribution of the genetic, various genetic components for, for the clinical phenotype. The phenotype changes with some of the phenotype, uh, predilections, of the infections changes with the different phenotypes. This is another study, a six-year follow-up study of BCGOSIS patients. Uh, it is a cohort of uh, 70 patients of which 32 patients has got, uh, it turned some, finally turned out to be some specific primary immune deficiency disorder. In th that cohort, the commonest variant was chronic granuloma disease is another type of primary immune deficiency disorder. Some patients were hyper IgM syndrome, hyper IgE syndrome, severe combined immune, immune deficiency, and MSMD. So it's not important to know all these names, but it's, it's, one should start thinking of primary immune deficiency disorder if we find something unusual. This is the 10 clinical point is, uh, proposed by the Jeffrey Model Foundation of primary immune deficiency. One means one should think of primary immune deficiency. If you look, there are two points from the dermatological perspective. If you are getting any patients with a recurrent deep skin or organ abscess or the persistent thrust in mouth or fungal infection in the skin, one should start thinking of primary immune deficiency disorder and one should work up for primary immune deficiency disorder. So uh, there are other clues for the primary immune, uh, cutaneous clues for the primary immune deficiency disorder, of which very classical thing is eczema. Eczema in a child at the very, very early age, one should look, just look for the hemogram. A complete hemogram can give a very definite clue for a, whether you are dealing with any primary immune deficiency disorder or not. Any patients with eczema and if there is a thrombocytopenia, in all practical possibility, you are dealing with an East Scott entry syndrome. There are other syndromes which also can have eczema-like presentation, and these are the various cutaneous manifestations like ocular telangiectasia, severe dermatitis, uh, erythroderma, cutaneous granulomas, oral ulcers. This could be, if there is very unusual infections or recurrent infection, just start thinking of primary immune deficiency disorder. The, the, the other cutaneous manifestations are uh, periodontitis, oral or nail candidiasis, the recurrent abscess of cellulitis that I have mentioned as a part of the 10 uh, important points mentioned by the Jeffrey Model Foundation, and uh, recurrent organ granulomas and recurrent abscesses. So all these things are pointers for something uh, wrong in the underlying immune system.
So uh, thank you. The uh, take home message possibly uh, whenever you you hear for hope bit, don't, just don't uh, think of cause. Just um, start thinking of the drugs also. If you don't suspect, you cannot be take the entity. Thank you. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, now I'm sharing my screen. So it's time for panel discussion. Excellent presentation. Congratulations, Dr. Orgo. Thank you. Uh, again, we are missing two giants with us. Dr. Dhar. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Make it full screen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dr. Dhar and Dr. Sharma, but we have another academic giant with us, Dr. Sudip Ghosh, Professor Dr. Sudip Ghosh. If I go through his uh, CV, it will take another 30 minutes, I would think. But uh, I don't think these facts and figures can only justify his credentials. He is much more than these. Welcome, Professor Ghosh. And when I go through uh, Dr. Bonostri's uh, CV, it is also very much impressive as far as the pediatric dermatology is concerned. So let's start the discussion. Uh, this is my first question to Dr. Ghosh. How can you differentiate between viral exanthem and drug rash? This is a, probably one of the most confusing situation in our day-to-day -day, uh, clinical practice. Uh, let it let it let put it in a, in, a, in a practical situation. Suppose a child is suffering from fever. Now you put her on oral antibiotics. After that, she developed rash. Now, how can you differentiate whether it is viral exanthem or drug rash? Uh, not only viral exanthem and drug rash, you have to take into consideration other possibilities of such morbidiform rash affecting the face and other areas of our body. And now uh, let us start with the uh, viral exanthem and drug rash. We have to uh, clinically examine the patient thoroughly from head to toe, including the mucosa. That is very important. And you have to note the temporal relationship uh, of the development of this rash, particularly after intake of drug rash, or sometimes the rash may precede the intake of drug, particularly in this viral exanthem. Symptom is very important. Particularly in the setting of drug rash, uh, patient, the rash is often very much puroid. And a viral drug rash is uh, often less puroid. And sometimes you may get a combination of such things. The patient initially may have some rash, and after taking the drug, particularly in the setting of infectious mononucleosis or so, after taking ampicillin or so, the rash may be exacerbated. And the enanthin, you have to note the mucosal lesion also. Sometimes uh, you may get some characteristic lesions, just like coplic spot and others. And for investigation purpose, just a simple, your uh, complete hemogram report can guide. For example, if the patient has eosinophilia along with leukocytosis that favors uh, the uh, drug. So in that way, you have to categorically approach the patient. Dr. Uh, Bonosri, uh, you, you would want to make any comment? You want to add something on top of this? Clinical, uh, first uh, clinical. Huh. Sir, uh, Dr. Sharif has already told us important point in uh, differentiating between the two. But here in this case, um, I would like to, I mean, apart from this, uh, if uh, always it is not possible to have a very good correlation between drug intake and development of rash, but in case if that particular correlation is there, means that um, uh, time of onset, sometimes minimal rashes are present before intake, which generally patient overlooks. If we take history, not only from patient, but also from other family members, they can give us important clue that like uh, minimal over back, over um, trunk, if it is like a viral rash, um, it will start from inside center. Therefore, this particular areas which patient overlooks, that can provide an important clue to diagnosis. Okay, okay. Uh, let, let me sum up. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Ghosh and Dr. Bonosti covered almost all the topics. If we sum up in, in, a, in, a, in a very structured fashion, 
probably prodrome and constitutional symptoms would be much more in case of viral fever. Progression of rash over time. Uh, in case of viral exanthem rashes are almost fluctuating kind of course with time. And in case of drug rash, rash usually progress over time. Suppose it's a case of uh, evolving uh, Steven Johnson, then initially it would be a macular rash or macular rash, then it would become a purpuric. Uh, progression over the body, uh, if we get a particular pattern, suppose from face to neck downwards to rest of the body, probably we are dealing with a viral drug rash. And in case of dr uh, drug related rash, it would be all over the body at a, at a certain point of time. Color of rash, an experienced uh, dermatologist can pick up that very intense erythematous color or so-called drug, drug color. Sir already mentioned itching is much more prominent in case of drug rash. Skin tenderness, that is also important point that would favor uh, obviously your uh, uh, drug rash. Mucosal involvement already sir mentioned, enanthem would be over inside the oral cavity would be much more for uh, viral and mucocutaneous junctions uh, with hemorrhagic crust like lips, these are more common for drug. Palm and soul uh, plus minus uh, mostly drug, but nowadays many viral infection also coming up with the palm and soul. Blood count sir mentioned, eosinophilia, yes, in case of virus, you can get some lymphocytosis and it is a case of severe kind of drug rash, you can have some derangement in liver function. So now coming to uh, Dr. Orgo, uh, when do you suspect a case of vasculitis presenting with skin rash? Simple skin rash would suffice or it would be something more? Uh, As, well, uh, vasculitis uh, per se, mm -hmm. there are two different types of vasculitis. You know? One is systemic vasculitis uh, and the new concept is emerging over time as a single organ vasculitis involving skin only. So in uh, patients with systemic vasculitis, most of the time they have uh, something plus than just a skin rash. So uh, depending on the skin rash uh, or the cutaneous manifestation, uh, uh, we broadly divide the vasculitis for our uh, practical ease to use or diagnosis into based on the uh, vessel size involvement. So this could be a large vessel, medium or small vessel vasculitis. So every uh, type of vasculitis has got a very uh, classical uh, cutaneous manifestation, like for the uh, small vessel vasculitis, uh, their usual presentation is uh, this uh, purpura kind of uh, skin rash, uh, uh, but whereas medium vessel vasculitis, we most of the time get a uh, bullous lesion or nodular lesion or a visual gangrene. No, I, uh, I, want something, I, I want something beyond skin rash. Skin, there are different type of rashes. That's fine. Do you fine. want to look want yeah. to look for something more in, into system? Or, yeah. Or, so depending on what kind of skin rash is present, we, we yeah. would uh, next plan for next kind of investigation. Like this patient, if uh, cutaneous rash is suggestive of the small vessel involvement. Mm -hmm. So though there is no boundary, but uh, in that case, we should think of uh, differential of the small vessel vasculitis. Like that, that again divided into anchor associated vasculitis and non anchor associated vasculitis. Anchor associated vasculitis can have upper respiratory involvement. So they can have nasal bleeding, nasal crushing, they can sinusitis. They can have pulmonary involvement in, in, in from the pulmonary nodule, pulmonary cavity. They can have renal involvement in, in the form of uh, rapidly progressing glomerulonephritis. Non anchor, the most commonly encountered in, uh, amongst the non anchor vasculitis in pediatric age group is the uh, anosolin papyrus, which uh, recently termed as an IgA vasculitis. So, this, uh, this group of patients usually have a renal involvement. So, whenever uh, we are having this kind of cutaneous manifestation, uh, one should look for the renal. I, I, would, I would come to that. Uh, okay. any, anything else you want to say? Okay. Dr. Ghosh, you want to add something? So from a <clears throat> dermatologist's point of view, mm. whenever you come across uh, such kind of lesion <clears throat> in your clinical practice, first of all, you have to identify the morphology of the lesion. Mm. If you are suspecting a case of small vessel vasculitis, usually you have to answer three questions, three very important questions for the uh, etiological diagnosis of the condition. First of all, whether the lesions are consisting or consisting with your diagnosis of small vessel vasculitis. So what are the clinical manifestation, cutaneous manifestation of small vessel vasculitis. Usually symmetrical palpable purpura, which is partially blanching. 
So on dioscopy, it will demonstrate partial blanching. You may get some arterial lesion, some ulcerative or infarctive lesion, some vesicles or pustules, sometimes nodules, and rarely you may get also a libido pattern or targetoid lesion in the setting of small vessel vasculitis. So first of all, you have to identify that. And usually the lower extremity and other dependent areas of the bodies are involved. Secondly, if your morphological lesion is not conforming with your diagnosis of, uh, of with this, then you have to rule out the other vasculitis mimic. That is very also a very important part. So after uh, rule outing uh, vascular mimics like other vascular disorders like parniosis, like your other vascular occlusive disorder, like in the setting of DIC or TTP or homocystinuria, some embolic manifestation like your cholesterol emboli, purpura in the setting of uh, thrombocytopenia or platelet function disorder. Sometimes it may be manifestation of sepsis and other dermatosis as well. So after that, whenever you uh, are confirmed that you are dealing with a case of morphologically a small vessel vasculitis, you have to rule out the systemic features. The systemic features in the form of constitutional symptoms, respiratory, cardiological symptoms, GI symptom, musculoskeletal, renal, uh, your ENT involvement, eye involvement, and also the CNS. And you have to particularly find out some clues to the diagnosis. Suppose uh, you are dealing with a vasculitis with paresthesia and food crop along with your bronchospasm. You have to rule out eosinophilia with granulomatous polyangitis, like your uh, that is known as Chakstros syndrome. If you are getting abdominal pain, you have to rule out IgA vasculitis, EGPA, MPA, uh, rheumatoid vasculitis, lupus vasculitis, and Bechet's disease, amongst others. Uh, just like in this fashion, you have to rule out the systemic features. Dr. Dr. And, Bonosri, yes, sir, yes, sir, please continue. And, okay, and the other thing is that you have to find out the suspected etiology. Yeah. This, this is up to your clinical approach, then you have to go for biopsy and other investigations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Bonosri, uh, would you want to add something? Uh, sir, what I understood from the question that you want to ask, when do you suspect a case of vasculitis present with a skin rash? Yeah. That means when there is a skin rash, uh, like clinically saying it, what are the points that will help us uh, at first to make this diagnosis that it is not a normal rash? Yeah. So usually, uh, like... Uh, just, uh, just, just, blog, just be very brief so that we can move to uh, other questions. So that uh, when uh, in the quarter block, the lower extremity is involved, like lower extremity can be involved in like insect bite hypersensitivity. There are other causes also. But in vasculitis, itching will be lesser as compared to the other proportion like pain and burning. Therefore, first point of diagnosis is that patient will complain of like uh, less itching and more pain and burning in case of vasculitis as compared to other skin rash, uh, which we generally encounter in this location. And apart from that, uh, my teacher, Dr. Sadeep Mukhosh has already uh, said all the uh, so, other- So, so you agree that things. along with the rash, there are chances of involvement of multiple organs, according to multiple the- Multiple organ symptomology. involvement, okay. that, that we need that's to- That's the point. Them. That's the point actually what I want to project that uh, it's, whenever you are dealing with the vasculitis, mostly it's a, it's a multi-system, uh, disorders, so look for the other system. Problem arises when there is no skin rash, only symptoms are only organ specific. For example, if you are dealing with only gastrointestinal HSP, a patient presenting with colicky abdominal pain only, then the baby might uh, go through this un un unnecessary investigations or interventions and laparotomy or appendicectomy. So that's, the, that's my uh, point. Now, moving to the next question, this is for Dr. Banasri. What is the exact timing to do the biopsy in case of HSP? I have two parts in this question. First one, do you think it is absolutely necessary to do biopsy and in each and every cases of HSP clinically diagnosed, number one? Number two, why I put this question? Many times it happens that uh, after five or six days, day six or five of illness, those pediatric residents actually they brought this they bring this patient to us uh, for opinion whether we need to do any biopsy or not after they settle down the fever or the inflammatory symptoms so what is your take uh, sir uh, i generally don't do biopsies in case in each and every case of hsp Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in a medical college setting or in like in a research institute it can be done because it is like a marker of later stage of renal involvement whatever what uh, is the activity of that disease uh, to just to know and to uh, reinforce our diagnosis because that will help us to further follow up because here we know that in Henoxal and Pipira, 
a systemic symptom can manifest even after the disease has subsided, yeah, yeah. indicating that renal involvement. Therefore, for particularly for that purpose only, it could be done. And uh, regarding the second part, uh, do you think day six or five biopsy is sufficient? Um, day six so or five. Um, sir, I would like to transfer this question to Dr. Shridhar Prosh. Okay, because, sir, uh, sir, please uh, take it up. So in the day five or four, we usually don't do any biopsy. Biopsy should be done always for the both for the histology, H and D, and for DIF, you have to do early biopsy. Definitely. That is the yeah. criteria. Regarding but the several, part... several, several authors argue that skin biopsies are not indicated unless the diagnostic criteria based on clinical presentation are not met, or mm -hmm. if the presentation is atypical or incomplete. So yeah. if the patient already fulfills the diagnostic criteria, there is one mandatory criteria. And this criteria has been uh, uh, formulated by Euler, Printo, and Press for yeah. uh, periodic rheumatology purpose. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Uh, that is a mandatory criteria. The mandatory mm -hmm. criteria is that purpura or petechi with lower limb predominance and minimum one of the four one criteria the, is uh, there. Yes. Diffuse abdominal pain with acute onset, histopathology, characteristic histopathology with characteristic DIF, arthritis or arthalgia of acute onset, and renal involvement in the forms of either proteinuria or hematuria. If the patient already fulfills the criteria, you may uh, avoid biopsy. But in so, a hospital setting, in a medical college setting, we usually perform biopsy with GI. So take-home message always, for, to, always from the early yeah, lesson. Yeah, so take-home message is two. You need not to do biopsy in each and every cases if you can clinically diagnose, number one, because that is not the absolute criteria. And day five or six biopsy would not, uh, would not uh, bring anything to you. So now I'm going to my uh, next question. It, this is for Dr. Ghosh. Uh, uh, sir, do you want to give oral steroid to any case of HSP? If so, then uh, what are those conditions where you, you uh, want to give? So the, the treatment of the, uh, the, your HSP or IJ vasculitis is, usually depends on mainly one parameter, whether renal involvement is present or not. Yeah. If renal involvement is present, and you have to take a multidisciplinary approach, and yes. usually the renal part is treated by either nephrologist or pediatrician. So without renal involvement, the treatment is purely symptomatic, pain medication, rehydration therapy. And sometimes you may need for surgical consultation because uh, the, uh, in sometimes there may be intersusception, bowel infection or other complications of HSP. So a multidisciplinary team is very important. So in case of skin necrosis with ulceration, wound therapy uh, is very important. Compression therapy, absolute rest, and uh, often uh, topical steroid and paracetamol that is sufficient. But uh, if there is renal involvement, uh, that part should be treated by pediatrician and nephrologist. However, the treatment with corticosteroid, uh, there is enough controversy is there. And recently, an updated Cochrane review, they showed that five, they have compared five randomized control trial formed on the basis of this review and none of the studies presented evidence for the benefit of corticosteroid treatment and renal involvement. So the treatment with your corticosteroid is doubtful. There are some other options. Some recent literature showed that mycophenolate mofetil is very important. Dapsone can be tried in some studies and even rituximab. They have shown promising result in some studies. And cyclophosphamide also- We will go to the treatment part later on. I, I just okay. want to ask you a very specific question. Do you think if the presentation is atypical like bullous, hemorrhagic, ulcerative lesions, or if the other system involvement is very, uh, very uh, painful for the patient, like debility during uh, arthritis, severe abdominal colic, in that case, we can use- So from a dermatologist point of view, if there is severe cutaneous lesion, in that mm -hmm. case, you can go for a short course of uh, system short steroid. Course of there steroid. is no help. But however, whenever there is- Short course means for two other... weeks, two weeks, for two weeks. Okay. For two weeks. Okay. Yeah. And for systemic involvement, you have to take a multidisciplinary approach. Dr. Orgo, you want to add something on this uh, regard? Yes, like uh, it's not just the renal agent and GI involvement, you will request the right for uh, better outcome. Otherwise, there might be chances of operations or uh, in GI yeah. emergency. Yeah, so yeah. GI and renal, these are the usual yeah, yeah, like, things which we get. Other so, rare manifestation can have like CNS, and those, those things are very rare things. So any other organ involvement beyond skin, any major organ involvement, then we may plan to start steroid. Uh, otherwise, as that mentioned. Uh, so take home message is quite clear if the presentation is atypical or is there organ involvement as said by our eminent panelist, GI, renal, 
and if there is symptoms are so severe we can use the steroid for short course but please do remember steroid will not prevent relapse this is this is number one and number two steroid would not prevent the future renal involvement and please do not pump steroid without ruling out infection otherwise you the baby will be in trouble so my next question uh, to dr orho only uh, so uh, to prevent relapse or uh, to delay or prevent renal involvement do you want to use any immunosuppressive is if so then what are your choice of immunosuppressives what is the lowest stage you use till date and uh, for how long like uh, for uh, there is nothing to for prevention like if there is a renal involvement then we can plan to start immunosuppressive so most of the time uh, again because steroid is a very rapidly acting thing so we start with steroid and plan to taper as fast as possible and we always try to use a second agent uh, for a steroid sparing and for a yeah. long term whatever we can use so these days we do prefer uh, mycophenolate and both as as a therapeutic we often use uh, in view of side effect profile we often to choose mycophenolate but if there is a financial constraint then we need to move to as a therapeutic so and then the treatment uh, duration is depends on the how the patient is responding we need to check the creatinine and uh, 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 routine urine for whether rbc is uh, there in the so you, so you take pediatric nephrologist along with pediatric nephrologist you 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 take or you yourself uh, follow up with this creatinine and urine all most things? most of the time it's the pediatrician and us uh, not okay. pediatric nephrologist because i think yeah. there is hardly any pediatric nephrologist in the city okay okay, okay. Uh, in collaboration and what the is the lowest system? stage you have used uh, this uh, uh, mycophenolate uh, i think it was uh, Four years or five years, eh? Four years. Like that. Quickly, yeah. I'm going to Doctor Ghosh, uh, uh, sir, in one or two lines uh, regarding this. You, if you have anything to add, because we have a no, lot not, of questions no. pending. Now, immune suppressives, uh, we usually do not prefer for cutaneous lesion. Okay. Hardly we have to give a short course of systemic steroids sometimes. Done, uh, Doctor Banasri, you you just want to add anything on top of this? No, sir. Same. Immune suppressives we don't. Okay. Uh, so uh, please, uh, these are some few facts. Very, very important. Renal involvement occurs in 40 to 50 percent of cases, and end-stage renal disease uh, is seen in 5 percent of cases. So that's why what Dr. Orho already mentioned: long-term follow-up is very important, very, very important. And these are the few uh, few uh, prognostic factors which can which can throw some light that this baby can develop a renal uh, involvement in near future, like persistent purpura and so on. Now, uh, moving to my next question, this is for Dr. Banasri. Uh, why I put this question? Uh, because a few years back, I uh, actually, I was fortunate to listen to Dr. Professor Surjit Singh from PGI Chandigarh. Dr. Orgo probably must be knowing him. He is a, he is a doyen in uh, this field of Kawasaki disease. I was totally mesmerized by his uh, presentation. The last sentence actually struck me very, uh, uh, very uh, 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 efficiently that, Whatever criteria or investigations, whatever exists in the art, if you want to diagnose a case of Kawasaki disease, you learn, you should learn to smell its presence. That is the very important word. So that means it's very difficult. Its, its, it's characteristics are not so uh, well formed. So my question to Dr. Bonosri, uh, suppose carlitinib from rash is also a presentation of Kawasaki disease, as we all know. So. Do you search for Kawasaki disease in each and every cases of scarletin from RAS? Or in other words, uh, what are the clinical pointers which, uh, which, 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 which alert us that this, this might be a case of Kawasaki disease? Uh, sir, it has a specific, like when you see a case, case of Kawasaki disease, it has a very specific like clinical feature, very, very specific look the patient will have. Apart from the exanthem, the history of fever, patient will have like tongue will be like quite red with uh, there might be colitis so that, also. That, that, that might also be present huh. in scarlet fever. What are the, what are the pointers uh, that, we, that would help you? Sir, uh, peeling of skin, like uh, hand. That, that would not happen initially. That, that mm -hmm. would take some time. Mm -hmm. Sir, Anything? colitis, okay. those are only the pointers. Dr. Ghosh, you want to add something? Yes, uh, uh, Kawasaki disease, uh, scarlet fever is a very important differential diagnosis of your Kawasaki disease. Uh, 
So you have to uh, look at the mucosal changes. In case of Kawasaki, there is chance of erythema and vertical cracking of the lip. That is very important. Kawasaki usually patients with red strawberry tongue. And on the other hand, scarlet fever usually patients with white strawberry tongue. And in case of Kawasaki, the erythema and prominent fungiform papilla you can uh, visualize. And it usually has some bilateral bulbar non-exudative conjunctivitis. That is very important that favors the diagnosis of Kawasaki. The lesions of Kawasaki is usually polymorphous in nature. That is also very important uh, differentiating feature. There is maculopapular diffuse erythema. And sometimes pastule you can get. Sometimes you may get some erythema multiformi-like lesion, sometimes articarial or micropastular lesion. That is very important. And in case of uh, scarlet fever, that usually doesn't happen. There is patients of pastias line in case of scarlet fever. And uh, some extremity changes are also very important. Acute yes. phase in case of Kawasaki, there is erythema and edema. And in subacute phase, you can, you can get uh, uh, discomation, particularly in the periangual discomation. But uh, uh, remember that in case of scarlet fever also, you may get some uh, discomation in the extremity. And lymphadenopathy, acute non-supportive cervical lymphadenopathy, that also favors Kawasaki. And periangual uh, discomation, that usually doesn't occur in the setting of scarlet fever. That is a more specific feature of Kawasaki. So apart from this thing also, you have to rule out other causes of morbiliform and polymorphic lesion like viral. That, 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 I'm, that we are not going. We, are, we restrict our discussion okay. here only. Okay. okay. So uh, uh, so uh, this is very comprehensively uh, covered by Dr. Ghosh. Uh, unexplained fever. And these are the few uh, clinical clues. Already mentioned everything. Child will be extremely irritable. This is another important point. Inflammation of the BCG scar, that is another important point. And Sir already mentioned edema of hand feet and all this. And in what happened in scarlet fever, this, this Kawasaki patient will not respond to antipyretic very promptly, but uh, this scarlet fever patients will do. And if you put the scarlet fever patient on a broad spectrum uh, antibiotic with gram positive coverage, the fevers settles down within uh, 24 to 48 hours. This is a very important point. And, and if, you, if you consider scale, scales, this scarlet fever scales also very fast. And, and the scales are uh, in large sheet, just like this from pump. Uh, but uh, in case of KD, the scales usually appear during coalescence stage, stage at, at around two weeks. And these are very fine superficial uh, scales. These are the very few important points. Now I would go to, uh, Dr. Orvo, uh, uh, how do you approach a case of suspected Kawasaki disease? I mean, if you were suspecting it, it is to be a Kawasaki disease, do you put the baby on uh, IVIG or any alternative medicine uh, if you prefer? So please uh, tell us about that. Yeah, like uh, the Kawasaki, you know, whenever they reach to us, is most of the time uh, it's a non-responding fever and patient is very uh, sick in most of the time and irritable. So uh, we do require immune uh, in the form of immunoglobulin supplementation for almost each and every patient of Kawasaki along with the aspirin. And nowadays for uh, better outcome and some of the patients we are using infliximab for uh, okay. prevention of the uh, coronary involvement and for the, for the progression. So basically, uh, you know, it's a uh, high state of inflammatory state. So uh, you, you, the faster you can reduce the inflammation, there will be less damage. Unlike the other vasculitis, the most of the vasculitis require lifelong treatment. That is odd for the Kawasaki. It's most of the time is a monophasic disease. So yeah. uh, usually don't. Uh, so so, relax so if, most if, of the if, the, if even if the patient is not fitting with the criteria, we are suspecting it to be a case of Kawasaki. You will put it, put the baby on. IVIG, that is your take, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, actually, there is no, uh, uh, I should not sound like that, there is no criteria, but uh, the criteria are meant for, uh, for making diagnosis on a large scale. So yeah. whenever you see more and more patients there, uh, every time, every few years, you, you see there will be a change in criteria. There is a time yeah, yeah. when uh, in rheumatoid and arthritis... Also, also you, you, you also tend to develop kind of inclination with that kind of profile. Yes. Dr. Ghosh, yeah, yeah. uh, what is your take? Would you put, so, put the another, baby another on IPH or only I would, aspirin? Another thing I would uh, like to mention first, uh, in the present era, you have to also rule out the multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. 
Okay. That usually presents with COVID like in, uh, in Kawasaki like manifestation in the yeah, setting yeah. of COVID. Yeah, it has so already been discussed in early morning. Yes, so, uh, as uh, Dr. Chatterjee has rightly pointed out, that IVIG and uh, your aspirin, and sometimes if the size of aneurysm is much more uh, large and in the setting of large aneurysm, often uh, the other clopidogrel or even uh, heparin yeah. can be needed. And there are some recent studies uh, showed that uh, uh, that uh, combination of uh, your uh, corticosteroid along with IVIG uh, have some promising result. So that is only have some adjunctive role in the setting of IV, uh, your, uh, your Kawasaki disease. And sometimes calcineurin inhibitor like cyclosporine has some studies also. And uh, interleukin-1 yeah. inhibitor like anakinna, that anakinna, is also yes. an important drug that is undergoing uh, prospective trials. Okay, okay, well, well. But so, is not available in India. Yes, yes. Hmm. So the, I just want to mention a very important point. Uh, already we are discussing about IVIG. IVIG would reduce the rate of coronary involvement about 4 to 5%. So it's, it's always necessary whenever you are suspecting case of Kawasaki, put the, uh, put the baby on treatment, start the treatment without any delay. This is number one. And coronary artery dilatation, even with even in appropriately treated patients, it occurs in 5 to 10%. So uh, it, it actually reflects what is the importance of starting treatment early. So uh, uh, my next question to Dr. Bonosri, rickettsial disease is another important differential uh, with this kind of presentation, rash and fever and all. So uh, just tell me before that, uh, why it is important to diagnose a rickettsial disease early? What so do you what treatment, you do? So because treatment of rickettsial disease is usually easy, but if we overlook, like if we have missed rickettsial disease, then it can be like life-threatening in some cases. Yes, that's also. the point. It, Mortality rate is very high. Now I would go to Dr. Ghosh. Uh, why, sir, it is difficult to diagnose a case of rickettsial shell disease? What is the... Because they often may present with some your polymorphic rash. Initially, uh, particularly the uh, spotted fever mimics uh, your Kawasaki disease. So initially okay. the rash uh, may be pink, blanching, discrete macule, and subsequently, which becomes uh, more form, petechial or hemorrhagic. But there are some certain clues, particularly some gangrenous or necrotic change and uh, presence of your SCAR. ESCAR is also a very important clue to the diagnosis and particularly uh, rash over the palms and soul. That is an important pointer. And particularly the GI symptom and headache or CNS symptom, they are much more uh, prominent in the setting of your rickettsial disease. And, thank you uh, very much. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Obhijit. I think we have to end. Please, you have... Sir, I have no, just one question. I would take two minutes. Okay, okay. One question only allowed. Okay. Sir, sir, please. Sir, please. Okay, okay. Continue, Continue sir, please. Okay. Very fast. Okay. Dr. Ghosh, please continue. Uh, I, have, I have completed. Okay. 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 Bonasri, uh, so, so uh, Bonasri, you, you want to make any comment? Very fast. One or two lines. No, fine. Okay. So why it is difficult to diagnose uh, non-specific symptoms, uh, headache, fever, myalgia, arthalgia, and all this. Rash. Rash may not be the initial presentation, number one. If even if it present, uh, uh, it, it appreciation in a dark skin people is very difficult. Number two, and rash even not present in all cases. So, for example, rash is less common in scrub typhus. It's just that said pathognomonic, but it is not diagnostic. It may present in different other disorder. And sometimes we can miss the HR uh, if it is present in the body folds. Then then it also you cannot get that typical cigarette burn like appearance. This you get only this uh, shallow ulcer without any scab, and Another difficulty if, it, if the presentation is something odd, like purpura fulminans, unusual presentation. Presentation is systemic involvement only, fever and any pneumonia, this kind of presentation. So it's very difficult to suspect uh, rickettsial disease initially. And regarding labs, uh, there is no such sensitive and specific, easily available in next lab, lab test. Whatever have we have uh, that is well felic test, but its sensitivity and specificity, specificity is very low. IFA, IPA, this is a immunofluorescence testing. These are not available everywhere, only for research purpose. So uh, clinical clues are already said, uh, palm and soul involvement, retiform purpura, and all this. So diagnosis is really difficult here. And why we need to diagnose? Because if we don't diagnose, ultimately patient land up into mortality and you can see this long list of differentials. 
so along with the compatible clinical picture you need to uh, need to take into account this epidemiological feature like uh, exposure to rodent uh, uh, this uh, uh, travel to any endemic areas and so on so if you if you are both you are suspecting a case now is the suspected case response to respond to doxycycline if hr present and if laboratory tests are positive you can stamp it as a probable case but fallacy is that this uh, Available tests like Will Felix and Eliza, they are positive only after seven days. So you should not wait for seven days to confirm the lab test, otherwise patient will go. So you have to start doxycycline uh, that very moment. And regarding PCR, the only test you can diagnose early, that is PCR, uh, you can extract the DNA. But again, this is not that much easily available and practically feasible. So that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all uh, for patients listening and thank you my panel i have an exciting uh, discussion with all of you thanks thank you all